So thank you for joining us here with DSG and Dennis Urban CDT, who will be presenting the occlusal splints diagnosis, fabrication, and treatment webinar. Dennis brings over 40 plus years of dental technology field experience, including lab management, technical training, sales and marketing, product development, and quality assurance. A seasoned dental lab manager by day, Dennis also balances being an eminent lecturer worldwide since 1985. And with that, it is my pleasure to say, take it away, Dennis. Well, thank you, Jessica, and good evening, everybody. And uh, yeah, 40, 40 years plus experience. Uh, I'm getting old. I'm starting to get the hang of it now, you know, after 40 years, though. But uh, I love what I do, and uh, you know, good evening, everyone, and good afternoon on the West Coast, and thank you for joining us. Um, you know, one of the most important joints in the human body is the uh, temporomandibular joint, you know, and which connects the skull to the jaw. And um, it's also one of the most problematic joints uh, due to the TMJ disorder, and, uh, T or TMJD, as they call it. The TMJ disorder, um, it's, uh, it results in pain, tenderness, swelling, and other symptoms around the face and jaw. You know, and TMJ disorder is fairly common. And depending on the severity of the pain and the discomfort that the patient experiences, it can, always also, it can also be fairly easy to treat. So, so tonight we're gonna talk about diagnosis, fabrication, and treatment of occlusal splints. There's a lot of information with this, uh, you know, on this topic here, and we're gonna to get to it now. There are a lot of information in, packed into one hour. And we're going to go through some of the uh, aspects and some, some of the to uh, topics we're going to be speaking about. So, like Jessica mentioned, this is me. My, me. This is me in Little Italy at the San Gennaro Festival before uh, social distancing. But um, uh, I'm a big foodie and wine, wine connoisseur, and uh, I, I love what I do in dental dental industry. Uh, and I, I got the opportunity to travel around the world and lecture and meet dentists and go to dental practices all, all around the world and dental laboratories. And uh, I keep on learning. I never stop learning. I love, I love talking about dental technology from dentures to, uh, to implants to, uh, to occlusal splints, you name it. And we do a lot of different webinars here at DSG. So with that, this is the webinar outline tonight. We're going to talk about examination and diagnosis, TMJ pain, centric relation, appliance types, fabrication, printed versus traditional. We have a nice little presentation on uh, CAD CAM technology with occlusal splints also. Uh, talk about material science, patient acceptance, and goals and predictability. So, some of the frequently asked questions on uh, on splint therapy is uh, what is occlusal splint therapy? What types of splints are, are available? How do splints work? And which type of splint will, should be used and when? And how often should splints be adjusted? So, we'll get into the adjustment part later on, but uh, these are some of the most frequent questions asked. And what is occlusal splint therapy? Occlusal splint therapy may be defined as the art and science of establishing neuromuscular harmony in the masticatory system by creating a mechanical disadvantage for the parafunctional forces with a removable appliance that's uh, constructed. So we want to, we want to uh, you know, um, get rid of those parafunctional forces because it's going to be a negative uh, force with the TMJ. And a properly constructed splint facilitates a mutually protected, protected occlusion. So occlusal terms. Mouth guard, bite guard, bite plate, hard splint, soft splint, combination, there's full arch coverage, there's coverage of several teeth uh, for TMGA disorder. We'll talk about the NTI appliance later on. And, uh, you know, hard splint and soft splints or occlusal splints are the most uh, popular terms. I like to call it the therapeutically designed occlusal device to minimize TMGA discomfort and occlusal malfunction. But that's a mouthful, so we're going to stick with bite, uh, bite splint and occlusal splint. So, uh, so let's talk about the categories uh, with these types of splints. There's two types which are very popular, stabilization splints. They prevent teeth grinding and clenching, and splint coverage is all the teeth typically, and it's typically just, just worn at night. Uh, and repositioning splints are designed to correct occlusion, and they're typically worn all day, every day. So, and I just like to start with the basics, and usually, you know, all my seminars and webinars, I start with the basics, because this is what's gonna get you first to a successful case. So, uh, but how does splint therapy resolve issues? Well, the splints allow the ligaments and muscles to relax. It prevents jaw reactions such as grinding and clenching. I've had that problem. I had to make myself a splint. And millions of people have that same problem. And it, uh, these splint therapy uh, appliances eliminate pain and discomfort. And uh, it helps bring occlusion into a more optimal, optimal position. So you want that patient to get into a good, easily uh, uh, found uh, centric occlusion, so uh, centric relation. Uh, we want to get them in that physiological rest position so they can easily chew and feel comfortable. And we want to offset the negative effects of bruxism. So signs and symptoms of unhealthy occlusion. Well, many people have it. I have it on my, my teeth also. Wear, fracture, and chipping of teeth. 
you know, for years and years, I spent a lot of money getting braces and moving, uh, getting my teeth just the way I like to like, like them to look. And as, as I got older, I started getting wear and, and uh, chipping of teeth uh, because of the uh, bruxes in my head. Uh, and many people have that type of uh, symptom also. Sensitive crevices on teeth or gums, gum and bone recession, loose or shifting teeth, and worsening of periodontal diseases, you know, so damage to dental bridges and implants also. You know, how many times we make uh, dental bridges and implants in the laboratory and we get people, uh, uh, patients just uh, breaking uh, porcelain off the bridges or especially with uh, the cornea restorations on anterior bridges and even hybrid type cases. So this is why we make a, a protective uh, appliance, uh, a bite splint appliance when we, this patient is spending all this money on uh, getting full mouth rehabilitation. We want to protect that, uh, that uh, prosthesis that we made. So, uh, and it's the tenderness of jaw muscles and headaches and, and noises when you open and close your jaw. And we'll look at the reasons for that clicking when you open and uh, close your jaw in a little while. So, and this is interesting. Occlusal forces can equal up to 500 pounds per square inch. <clears throat> That's a lot of occlusal force. You know, when the jaws close, your teeth should come together evenly and at the same time without any tooth or teeth touching before one another. You know, that's what they call physiologic uh, central occlusion. When they don't touch evenly, this puts stress on your teeth and the supporting bone. Jaw, joints, and muscles, and clenching or grinding can magnify this problem. So we want to rectify this problem with a, a correct occlusal splint. Here's some of the symptoms, uh, headaches, aching pain in around your ear that creates uh, sharp facial pain, dizziness, joint locking or popping that creates ear pain, and then you have pain and tenderness in the jaw, which can result in facial swelling, and pain and difficulty chewing, and uh, also neck and upper back muscle spasms. So there's a lot of different disorders, and sometimes it's hard to diagnose what TMJ disorder is because there's so many symptoms to it. So uh, uh, it's, it's pretty interesting how much is involved in, in just diagnosing the correct appliance. So some of the concerns. Let's talk about the type of appliance, the type of design, the length of the treatment, and this is important, and, and the amount of time, and many times that patients have to come back for adjustments, uh, expected results, and patient acceptance. It's very important. Patient acceptance is very important. We don't want that patient taking that uh, appliance out of their, their mouth when they're not supposed to, and it's just going to result in, in, uh, in nothing, nothing advancing as far as treatment. So uh, expected results. We want to decrease pain. We want to increase the range of motion and better occlusal efficiency. And on, ongoing increased improvement with, uh, uh, you know, as far, as far as their overall ability to chew and their uh, TMJ function. And a splint design with the quality material. We'll get into the, uh, the materials uh, and science of the splint materials in a little while, uh, but, uh, and I'll show you what the, the materials that I've used over the years that were very, very successful and the ones I'm still using. And expected results. You want to protect the TMJ from dysfunctional forces. And this is what the correctly made splint does. And to stop the possibility of perforations or displacement. We want to create a stable, balanced occlusion and create a harmonious relationship of all muscles, discs, ligaments, and bones. So this is uh, information from an IDT article that Leonard Hetz, Dr. Leonard Hetz wrote, uh, and he's on the senior faculty of the Dawson Academy. And oral, uh, you know, what to look for when you're examining a patient. And these are just, I think, five or six of the uh, uh, examination points that you should look for. He listed a bunch more, but I just wanted to, these were the key ones I wanted to bring up. Of course, you have to look at the oral me medical and dental history of the patient. We want to evalu evaluate the range of motion, the way the patient moves their jaw and how the intraocclusal space is uh, when they open and close and how they function. We want a centric relation load test for the patient. We want to evaluate the dentition wear, look at their, uh, the wear facets on the teeth and see what's really the cause of uh, this whole situation with the uh, dentition wear and a CBCT or MRI if necessary. And I think it's necessary to do that with every case. So let's look at the analysis of discs and limit ligaments. You know, the disc is the cushion that separates the lower jaw from the skull base. And the ligaments help to tether the disc to the mandibular condyle, as you see right here. So it sounds simple, but there's so many problems associated with it, you know? So, and the analysis of disc, disc and ligaments, you know, there's two ligaments, one close to the skin, lateral and collateral, and uh, the lateral uh, collateral ligament, and the other was closest, is located in the deep part of the joint, or a medial collateral ligament. Uh, so this, let's take all this in consideration and examine those ligaments when we're uh, ready to treat the patient for uh, occlusal therapy. One or both collateral ligaments may be injured in one or both joints. So that's important to realize also. Trauma or disease can cause any combination of collateral ligament uh, stretching or tearing. 
And the result of ligament stretching or tearing is that the disc may not, may or may not dislocate or herniate in that part of the joint with the ligament damage. So uh, this is one of the reasons why TA and J damage can, uh, can vary from one patient to another. So when you have disc herniation, uh, you know, CAT scan or MRI is, is advised to diagnose that herniation and TMJs you know, may be quiet or they may click or pop, like I mentioned earlier. And they might have uh, crepitus or sandpaper sounds also. In a normal TMJ, uh, the condyle can move forward away from the ear or backward towards the ear. If the disc is not herniated, then the joint should not make any sounds as the jaw is opened up. And if a ligament stretching, uh, a ligament stretching allows the disc to herniate, it will slip out of place when the jaw is closed. You know, when the jaw opens, a snapping or clicking sound usually represents the reduction of the condyle beneath the disc. And I hear that with a lot of patients. I can hear that clicking sound. Uh, my wife has the same thing, but she, she has that clicking sound. And, uh, and uh, we'll talk about uh, more about that later on. It's kind of a funny story, but I'll talk, talk about that later on. Upon uh, closing, the condyle typically slips off the disc again, and the pop may be heard upon closure. So you got that popping and cr uh, snapping sound with the, on the TMJ. So, uh, so some of the occlusal splint appliance choices, and we have a lot of choices out there. You know, the, one of the, you know, when I first started out in, in the laboratory, all we would make was pretty much a galb appliance and a flat plane appliance, you know, until we saw, you know, Dr. Dawson's studies and how it, it, it really just changed the way people think about occlusal splints. Uh, and we started using canine guidance splints to uh, really make the patient comfortable. And that's the type of splint I have. And we'll get into that in a little while also. But, um, yeah, it's NTI appliance we'll go over. There's a flat plane appliance, like I just mentioned. And then um, these are all, there's a lot more than these too. I just li I listed the more popular ones, the relaxer splint. And it's more, some, something like an NTI appliance, but it covers the full, coverages, uh, full coverage of the mouth. And a key splint, soft clear splint. And that's the splint that's, that we're gonna be talking about with CAD CAM technology. And anterior guidance. This is my mouth on the top here. It's a small picture. You'll see a larger picture later on. But ha I, I utilize a splint with anterior guidance and it really helps me with my occlusion, stops me from clenching, and just relieves any stress on my uh, TMJ. And I feel very comfortable with it. So, so let's look at the appliance types. First, you know, we're going to start with um, you know, the DSG appliance types. Just let me move this window here. Here. There we go. And uh, there's, there's a number of them. And these are the, you know, we have so much to offer with these uh, different appliance types for, you know, whatever diagnosis the patient, the dentist has for the patient. We have something called the DSG relaxer and the comfort a hard soft splint, a Bruxy splint, a Remedy splint, a key splint soft clear, and hard acrylic splints. And of course, the Gelb appliance. Now, when I get to uh, talking about um, uh, materials, I want to talk a little bit, bit about these hard acrylic splints and how you can insert a special material that's soft on the inside, which, war which um, softens up with the warmth in the mouth and makes it very patient, very comfortable for the patient. And it also, it's going to have that hard acrylic on the outside. So for those real bad bruxes, it's an excellent appliance. So but let's start talking about the uh, different um, uh, types of uh, splints here. If I oh, here we go. So the DSG relaxer, it's a custom fit anti-clenching -clench device that provides relief from migraine headaches and disorders. And as you can see here, this is where you have that disclusion on the, uh, on the anterior section. And then uh, the hard acry acrylic splint appliance, we've, we've talked about this earlier, and these splints have a hard acrylic surface to protect the teeth of heavy, heavy bruxers and grinders. And then there's a remedies and uh, the bruxies splints. So these splints relieve patient stress and bruxism. They also help protect investment of cosmetic restorations, like I spoke about before. So whenever we're doing these full mouth reconstructions, even small, uh, especially on the anterior region, we want to protect those investments and those, those restorations. And we, we talk about making a Bruxy's appliance. So, and Remedies is a hybrid type appliance made out of a heat cured acrylic for heavy, heavy Bruxy's. So, and then we have the uh, soft clear uh, appliance. Uh, this is the uh, key soft material. And, um, Gonna move this over the way. I have a window popping up on my screen here, uh, and this is a 3D printable material, and we'll get more into that, uh, the technique, and what that material is made up of in a little while, and why, in the past, soft appliances were really not that great for uh, for TMJ uh, fun uh, uh, function and for um, uh, occlusal therapy. Oops, let me just. Uh... There we go. Uh, and then the Gelb appliance. This, Gelb, this is probably one of, I made, so I probably made thousands of these appliances over my, my career here. And uh, it's this posterior splint covering uh, the occlusal surfaces of the uh, lower 
uh, low, you know, the mandible and the jaw. So, uh, and the mandible offers patient less discomfort compared to the other splints on, on this, uh, this type of splint and this posterior splint. So the gavel appliance for mandibular orthopedic repositioning is the most popular daytime TMJ appliance in the world. And the gavel appliance has been shown in evidence-based research to uh, treat temporal mandibular joint disc displacement, headaches, and sleep disorders effectively. And there's a picture of it intraorally. And this has, you know, I, I usually use two balls, one ball clasp on each side, but if, the, if there aren't any, any undercuts in the teeth, and I know it's going to have a feeling it's going to pop out, I'll add more ball clasps to these so there's more retention and the patient doesn't have to worry about popping out of their mouth. But uh, this is the average opening that you have with the, uh, you know, these types of appliances. So, and then we have the Comfort Heart Soft Bite Splint, uh, uh, bite splint Appliance. This is more of a, a vacuum form material, uh, very comfortable, very rigid, and, uh, and soft at the same time on the internally. And uh, it's two layers that make up this, uh, this splint. And with a standard flat occlusal plane, and it has slight opposing cuspal in indentations. So this is more on that, uh, that traditional flat plane type of appliance. And I just want to bring up here, I'm going to have to get up out of the screen here, but I'm going to show you what the DSG provides, and everybody's going to get one of these at the end of the presentation. I want to see if I could pull this up now over here. I'm going to open it up, and I'm going to stop. Oops. I'm going to stop share over here, and then I'm going to go into my share screen and pull up uh, this. There we go. So here, let's, if you see this occlusal guide, there's so much information here. It's a great chair side guide. Many clinicians, clinicians and doctors have this laminated. They keep it by their, their in the chair side and their operatory. And you can see all the information they have on here. I, can't, I don't have time to go through all the information, but we'll send it to you and you can look at it. There's material types, benefits and features on each one. Uh, uh, just uh, uh, some uh, designations on which one to use for which, which uh, type of diagnosis. diagnosis and requirements and instructions for use. So I just wanted to show this to you. Well, you'll all be getting this at the end of the, uh, in an email at the end of the seminar. So let me stop the share here and go back. Boy, I'm getting good at this. All right, let's see if that works. Okay, now I have to go back to uh, my, my screen here. All right, let's see, here we go, perfect. All right, so we'll take a look at that when you have more time and uh, you can, any questions, you can always contact me. I'll also give you my email address. Uh, you know, at the end of the seminar. But let's talk about the NTI appliance. You know, we call these wrap tooth appliances because it just covers two centrals and it has the little raised uh, part and on the anterior there where it excludes the uh, posterior teeth. So the, the NTI or TSS, I'm gonna see if I can say this real quickly, now susceptible to trigeminal inhibition tension suppression system. Say that 10 times fast. It's a small plastic device that is originally designed to prevent headaches and migraines caused by teeth clenching or grinding. The objective of the NTI is to relax the muscles involved in clenching and teeth grinding. So this is a popular little appliance. You know, you just have to be careful. You really have to make this retentive. I've heard stories of patients swallowing one of these at night. You know, so and that's not that's not good or choking. You know, so it's it's something that you really have to watch out for. It has to be made so it's pretty tight and fits tight on those anterior teeth. But the NTI uh, device is an anterior bite stop worn over the two front teeth at night to prevent contact of the canines and molars. And it's designed to be a deprogramming device. You know, it cannot be worn for more than six or eight hours a day uh, without the risk of tooth uh, drifting or eruption. You know, an NTI device helps the elevator muscles shut down around 70 to 80% you know, when the posterior teeth are not in inclusion. And this can greatly reduce inflammation. So, and then we have something with the dual arch type of splint like we showed you earlier, where it covers the whole arch and it still has an anterior uh, ramp over here. It's just a little piece written between the centrals. And, That'll, that's, to, that's meant to be worn more than eight hours a day. And there's no contact in the posterior teeth. Flat occlusal splints. You know, flat occlusal splints or relaxation or stabilize, stabilizing splints are in a widespread use and provide even occlusal contact, like I mentioned. And these are the ones I made much more frequently uh, years ago. And these may be constructed for the upper or the lower jaw. And the occlusal thickness of the splint has been addressed in studies. You know, and some studies show that splints that increase vertical dimension up to 4.4 millimeters and 8.2 millimeters, that's pretty high, were more effective in producing muscular relaxation in patients with bruxism and myofascial pain uh, dysfunction than one millimeter splint. So you know, the, the bottom line is you have to really uh, uh, evaluate and diagnose this patient on a regular basis. And uh, studies do suggest that a minimum of four millimeters increase in vertical dimension is necessary protect bruxing patients. You know, so uh, if the patient is wearing a splint four millimeters in thickness and still experiences muscle soreness, headache, or facial muscle tightness, immediately after walking, 
uh, then the splint thickness should be increased incrementally until the symptoms disappear. This is my splint here. This is a great uh, splint and I, it's very comfortable and you can see, you know, I, I, uh, my teeth, uh, I have the anterior ramp here and this is very comfortable. And this material I use here, I'll, I'll elaborate on this in a little while. It's, it's actually, when you put this in warm water, it softens up on the inside, but it's hard enough on the outside to, to really stand up to, to, to bad bruxers also. So, and I'm gonna talk about the, uh, the, just the fabrication of this, uh, this canine guided splint. So I'm gonna do, uh, traditionally, this is the way I would do it. And I would duplicate the working model, and then I'd articulate utilizing a semi or fully adjustable articulator. And the reason why I want to do this, I want to mimic true jaw movement. You know, I've gone to laboratories, I've done seminars and teachings, and I've seen uh, laboratories, or in, in these cases, mounted on hinge type articulators, which, you know, they don't have an intercondral distance of 110 millimeters, and it's not mimicking true jaw function. So we really want to mimic true jaw function and use a semi or fully adjustable articulator. So after I get that on the articulator, we'll open up the uh, bite, the appropriate opening. And many times the doctor would tell me where to open it or I'll evaluate it and uh, get back to the doctor and we'll brainstorm on how, how, how much the opening is going to be. I'll apply base plate wax and contour the wax to achieve canine guidance. I'll put that wax on the, on the model, I'll go back and forth on the articulator going to lateral excursions. And then I can, uh, I can, uh, I'm ready to process the case. And after the splint is waxed, then screws are put onto the posterior region. And you can either use a hydrocolloid material or a putty material. And I cover everything, the screws and the wax with the putty. Once the putty sets up, I take everything off, take that wax off, clean up the um, model, put some um, separator on the model, and I'll pour, actually pour this material. And I use an Astron clear splint material. That's the material I, I like to use. And I cure it in the pressure pot. And once it's cured in the pressure pot, I finish and polish it. Uh, before I do that, I place the, uh, uh, the model back on the articulator and make sure the bite is not changed. And I spot grind, I spot grind it in for canine guidance. And I finish and polish. Now, when I get to the, the, um, uh, the cat cam part of the webinar, you'll see that all this trouble I went through doing this, this takes, takes a lot of time. Uh, we can be now be done on, uh, on a system with three shape and ExoCAD designing it on a computer based uh, uh, type of application. And then we, we can mill it. So a lot has changed with the fabrication of these canine guided splints. So, and there's the cusp of the exclusion splint as you can see on the screen here. Very functional, very comfortable for the patient and easily worn. And uh, really, I don't get too many complaints on these types of appliances. So, you know, we talk about adjustments. Now, split adjust, splint adjustments were required with some weekly, some monthly. You know, I've talked to doc, some doctors where they had, they had to do it twice a week in the beginning, you know, so uh, it depends on how quickly your discs move and how they try to fully recenter in the TMJ position, you know, and patients want, must wear the splint as prescribed. Not like, uh, you know, taking it out of the mouth, this doesn't feel comfortable. It's almost like a sleep appliance, you know, we talk about sleep appliances and uh, that's going to be an upcoming seminar also. Uh, but sleep appliances, a lot of patients aren't comfortable with the night, you know, they're just pulling the jaw forward to open up the airways. And many times if they take it out of the mouth and it's not doing anything, we want to make sure the patient is comfortable with the appliance so they wear it at night, you know, so when they're supposed to wear it. So uh, you have to set up several adjustments, a relatively stable, healthy, reproducible hinge position of the jaw occurs. So it's very important to look at those adjustments. You know, not just give it to the patient, walk and say goodbye and, you know, good luck. You know, we want that patient to come back, evaluate it and see how that patient's chewing and, and uh, see maybe some, you have to make adjustments. I, I've been called to the dental office where we have to add a couple more millimeters on the posterior region uh, on the occlusal surface of the splint to make the patient more comfortable. So, and after stabilization of the jaw is achieved, it is then time to correct the underlying occlusal issues. So, you know, you, this, just because you're making an occlusal appliance, it doesn't end there. You know, because if not addressed, the occlusal abnormalities originally present will negate any process already made with splint therapy. And they're gonna be going back to the beginning. It could even be, be worse. So you wanna make sure you address those abnormal, abnormalities and we'll talk about that uh, in the upcoming slides. But um, let's call, talk about different splints here. You know, stabilization splints, they're, they're effective in the management of TMJ Arthralgia. And arthralgia is a term uh, used for TMJ pain caused by capsulitis and synovitis, which is an inflammatory condition of the articular capsule and soft tissues that surround the TMJ, much, much like I showed in that picture earlier in the presentation. So stabilization splint warnings. You know, to avoid the occlusal changes, you know, all patients with any appliance must be instructed not to wear it all the time. You don't want them to wear this 24 hours a day because additionally, appliances must be regularly checked and repaired if need be. You know, I have seen this and there have been cases where the splint has fractured in the area of the second molar or last molar 
And that's usually the thinnest part of the splint. And it's allowed this selective over eruption of the, 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 the posterior teeth causing an anterior open bite. So I really have to keep, keep an eye on these. Uh, you know, it's just like I talk about this also when I talk about my uh, partial dentures uh, uh, of my course, uh, getting a, a clear perspective on partial dentures. If they're not made correctly, they're actually, they're actually acting as an orthodontic appliance. So you really wanna make sure you have all your major and minor connectors in, in place and a right design. And the same with these types of uh, splints. So a major advantage to occlusal appliance therapy is that the treatment is reversible and non-invasive. You know, and the design must utilize anterior and condylar guidance to ensure the exclusion of all posterior teeth during protrusive, excursive, or any parafunctional mandibular movements, especially with complex, uh, complex restorative procedures, including change of occlusal, vert occlusal vertical dimension or jaw position. And you talk about repositioning splints. You know, currently, repositioning splints are the most popular appliance with deep bite correction. You know, these appliances load the incisors for intrusive effect, but leave your posterior teeth free, like I just showed earlier, free to erupt, therefore leveling the curve of speed, primarily by the posterior, by posterior extrusion, extrusion. So studies that involved the vertical changes of molars and incisors uh, with bite plane treatment found that the alveolar height in, in the molar region increased with minimal change in the incisal area, and the intrusive effect on the incisors was at best minimal. So, Repositioning splints uh, you know, consist of an acrylic platform. You can use uh, Adams clasp, ball clasp. If it's not, you don't have the retention there, I recommend these clasps or crib clasps. And anterior, anteriorly, a labial, a labial bow helps to stabilize the biplane. Like so I didn't have too much of a high labial bow in mind, but I've made appliances where I have labial bows that are pretty thick, you know, and they contact the teeth at the incisal uh, one third. And by acting as a premature stop, Usually within the confines of the intrusal occlusal space, the, the block forces the posterior teeth uh, from occlusal contact and allows them to erupt. So, uh, and it's not advisable to disclude the posterior teeth by more than two millimeters because this allows uh, this allows close supervision of the follow-up and treatment of progress prevents any sudden TMJ or myofunctional change. So you want to make sure that you have the right amount of uh, thickness. A nighttime splint has a number of purposes also. Prevent teeth from wearing, balance and support and relieve tension in the jaw joints, cranial bones, and muscles of the head and the neck. And uh, to open up and create more space for your tongue, increases tongue volume. So, and it also improves energy flow throughout the body as when you're using these at night. So, uh, you know, especially helpful during sleep to improve airway and breathing and facilitate a refreshing night's sleep, you know. I think we, we often use that in, uh, also with everything that's going on lately, a good refreshing night's sleep. But, uh, and we want to reduce the clenching and grinding to reduce headaches, neck, neck aches, and jaw aches. So, and this is interesting because I've gotten these cases in the labs with partial or complete dentures. Uh, and uh, doctors asked me to make splints uh, over the existing dentures. But you want to make sure that you know, these dentures have, are really retentive, especially with full dentures. You know, if they're not fully retentive, but what I've done in the past, I've actually made an appliance that goes over the edentulous ridges and with an opening, you know, usually the intraocclusal space on a full upper and full lower denture is about uh, 40 millimeters. So I try to keep that maybe to about 42 millimeters and it gets that patient more comfortable. But, um, you know, removable partial dentures may be used as occlusal splints also in much the same manner as uh, cast or resin occlusal splints uh, that are used on natural teeth. So they can, you can make these on uh, dentures. So, you know, I don't do too many of these on dentures. I have made snore guard appliances over dentures also, you know, but uh, you know, especially with, you know, have a good retentive denture, uh, it's not gonna work. So uh, if you want a good fitting denture, you send it to me or you send it to TSG. So, uh, and let's look at the classifications of bite splints. Uh, Dawson classified splints as permissive splints. These are muscle deprogrammers. Directive splints are non-permissive splints. And pseudo-permissive splints are soft splints and hydrostatic splints. So, and permissive splints allow the unrestricted movement of the mandible against the appliance, and most splint therapies fall into this category. Directive splints direct the mandible into a predetermined position, and these types of appliances should be used with great caution and only for very limited periods of time. Permanent occlusal change can occur, like I just I mentioned a few slides ago, with the use of improper direct splint therapy. So, an example of direct splint therapy would be an anterior positioning device that situates uh, the mandible into a position that is anterior to maximum intercuspation. And this is also from that article from Leonard Hess that I, I saw on, in IDT magazine. Um, and this is just uh, some of the classifications, again, of pain originating in the masticatory system structure. You look at the TMJ pain and you look at the muscular pain, two different categories here. And it goes from stretching, capsulitis, synovitis, 
and then it goes all the way down to myofascial pain and then myofibratic uh, contractor. So it's, it's very uh, in, in, intricate with all these uh, different uh, uh, things that are happening with TMJ problems. So we want stability. We want balance and centric relation on these splints. We want equal intensity stops on all teeth, immediate posterior disclosure, disclosure and smooth transitions and lateral protrusive and extended lateral excursions. This is why when we're making these splints, that's why I like to use that fully adjustable or semi-adjustable articular. We want to have comfort during wear and reasonable aesthetics and patient compliance. Otherwise, that patient's going to be taking this out of their mouth and, and not wearing it correctly. We want to relax the muscles, allow the condyle to seat in a musculoskeletal stable position, and provide diagnostic information for us, for the de uh, dentist also, and for the laboratory, uh, and in case we have to do any adjustments, and to protect teeth from associated structures from bruxism, and to mitigate periodontal ligament pro preception. So let's look at materials now. And you know, we took a look at the different types of uh, splints, and these have been more of the popular materials I've used over the years uh, to their various types of splints. The Astron Clear Splint is the one that I made uh, earlier, uh, and that was, a great, that was a great splint. That's a, a good material, and we'll go through some of the, uh, uh, we went through the, uh, uh, the procedure how to make that earlier. There's the Urcadent system where we use like a sort of vacuum type of, that's usually, usually used with the hard soft splint. And then we have the Comfort HS, which is also used with the Yerkadent system. Then we have hard cure, uh, heat cure acrylic. We're still making a lot of uh, heat cure uh, clear acrylic splints, but now I would say 95% of them now, I'm using the special procedure, and I'll, I'll show you in a little while when I put that, um, that special soft liner internally on these, on these splints. And that's material is called Versacryl, and that's what I put on the inside of these splints. So, uh, and then this Primatech material, it's a, it's a light cured material, and you can really actually make these pretty quickly. Uh, and it's a light cure material that cures in about five minutes in a light cure unit. And then this key soft, we'll get into that in a little while when we talk about the CAD CAM and uh, computer-based uh, type of uh, uh, production. So clear splint is the clear splint that, the splint that I made for myself. Uh, only the best for dentist urban, and I made it myself and I you know, through the guidance of a dentist, but I'm laughing because my wife has been after me for a long, long time to make her a splint. I still have to make her one, and it's been years now. And I don't want to tell you how many years, but I better get going with this because she's listening to my webinar tonight and she's going to ask me, when are you going to make my splint for me? So definitely have to make it. And if I'm going to make a splint, I'll probably make it out of this material. And uh, this is the clear splint powder and liquid. It's self-adjusting. And when I talk about self-adjusting, when you put it in warm water, it'll adjust itself and you insert it. It'll adjust itself around the contour and the emergence profile of the teeth. And this is a new type of uh, uh, procedure. But, you know, instead of going through all that uh, fabrication I talked about before, with the uh, you know the wax and boiling it out and pouring and curing and finishing, is now they have uh, uh, discs now that we can put into the milling machine uh, and we can uh, de um, design it uh, on uh, CAD, on CAD CAM and software and then uh, mill it. So either three shape or exacad. And this is the roll on milling machine that we use for uh, milling these types of splints. And as the Urcadent, this is a pretty cool machine too. It's just, you know, it, it's not just a suck down. You're able to use, utilize this uh, really intricate articulator. It's almost like a fully adjustable articulator while you're doing this. So when you're making the, um, the, the splint, you come back, back down onto the splint and you can go put indentations on there. You can even go into, into a little excursion on there to uh, uh, have excursive movements on here. So I like the Urcadent uh, system. We use that with a hard, soft material. And this is some of the material that's out there. Now I talked about Versacryl before. This is a unique material. I use this a lot, even with uh, various appliances I make and uh, even soft liners for dentures. And this material, it comes with a hardener and softener li uh, liquid. And you can use, you know, according to the ratio, that'll give you, you know, the level of hardness or softness. So I usually use like a 50-50 ratio. And once that hard acrylic um, um, splint is processed and finished, I have the model, uh, master model on the articulator. And what I'll do is I'll just remount the inside of that splint a little bit and I'll apply this Versacryl on the inside. I'll seat it back on the model, make sure I, I, the bite is correct on the articulator, and I'll put it in the pressure pot for 20 minutes. And it's, it is so comfortable for the patient. If you have patients who complain about comfort, comfort, uh, this is gonna be a comfortable splint. So you have the hard material on the outside and the soft material on the inside. You can utilize this with the, uh, uh, the material I just showed you or, or the hard acrylic. So uh, you can even use it with a clear splint material. So excellent product, uh, and I have to mention, any of these products I'm talking about, I don't get anything for it. The only reason why I mention these products is because I've been successful with them over the years. Dentists have been successful with them and the patient has been, you know, patient acceptance has been phenomenal. So, 
And this is Primatech. Primatech, I don't use that much, but it's, it's a great al alternative. And what we're doing here, this is, uh, you can see we block the teeth out here on the model, block out the undercuts. And this comes in a strip form and we place it over the uh, occlusal surface of the teeth and it's just adapted and then put it on the articulator, put separator on the opposing model and close down and you can make these splints. And then you put it into the light cured unit and uh, it cures probably in about, um, I think about 15, 20 minutes, it cures. And it's pretty cool. It comes in these rope uh, shapes here. And um, I also utilize this for verification, verification indexes when I'm doing implant cases or hybrid type bar cases too. So uh, great material and it's another option for uh, uh, making a splint. Acetyl resin material, I was just checking the time here to make sure I have enough time. Uh, acetyl resin material, this is, a, this is a great material also, and I've done a lot of splints one with acetyl resin, especially with, we're gonna open the patient's bite and we're getting them prepared for uh, newly uh, restorations, new restorations in the mouth, uh, full mouth rehabilitation or reconstruction. Uh, so I, I take this material and this is acetyl resin material comes in two shaded material and it's similar to the material they use for snap on smiles. And this is one of the, uh, one of the uh, examples of the acetyl resin. And this can open the bite, get the patient comfortable, and the patient can wear it all day long. And it, look, it also actually looks, you know, at the uh, aesthetics are great also. So the patient really doesn't mind wearing this. And it gets them in a comfortable position, getting them ready to open that bite for occlusal therapy. So this is before on, on, the, on the upper part of the screen here. And this is after when we open the bite. This is with that or acetyl resin material that we utilized. So it's great, great material. I use a lot of it, and this is the patient. Uh, she has so so overclosed here, and this is now she's feel, feeling comfortable. I see a problem right here. I see a check line in this number number nine here, and uh, that's going to be a problem. But she's going to get some rehabilitation on the mouth anyway. So not too sure what uh, what they were doing afterwards with this case, but very comfortable. Patient enjoyed it, and the, uh, it was comfortable. Look how nice the fit, cleansable. You could take it out, clean it, put it back in, and and uh, it really helped her condyl condyles also with uh, I feel a little more comfortable when she put this in. So there's before and after. Before on the top, she's really clenching, and then she's more comfortable uh, in that position with this, this appliance. So a lot of options you can utilize. And this is uh, the new material that you can utilize. You can utilize this with the CAT CAM technology also. It's called Zerolux Zero, Acetyl LTD. And you can make partial tensions out of this material. This is like a snap-on smile material here. This is more, more for an aesthetic reason that you see here. But you can also use them as bite openers and come in all the different Vita shades too. So uh, a lot of good options here uh, for materials. And uh, you know, so uh, you, know, you have all your choices. I'm not even, I didn't even mention all of them. There's a lot more out there too. So, uh, but th these have been most successful for me over the years. So with that, let's start with um, talking about uh, CAD CAM technology and digital technology with uh, bite splints. You know, we've come so far with uh, digital technology, um, especially in the last couple of years uh, on a removable side, uh, Crown and Bridge, we're doing so much more with, uh, with uh, Zirconia uh, and designing implant cases and uh, full arch cases. And now we're able to make these bite splints with uh, CAD CAM technology and it's great because uh, I love it because it makes life a lot easier. And so let's go through some of the aspects of this type of uh, technology. Uh, and it's exciting. It's fun. It takes a little while to learn the software. And you have your software choices. You know, the software is not as involved as, you, as when you're making a denture or doing crowns or anything like that. But uh, it, is, uh, it takes a little getting used to, but uh, especially if you're used to doing things the analog way. So let's go through step-by-step uh, step on these uh, digital technology placements. So first, we're going to look at the advantages of digital versus traditional. So now you can take a digital impression. You know, no impression material is necessary. My registration can be scanned. Uh, no gypsum is needed to pour models. It's reduced material and labor costs and reduced chair time. So it's really fast in the operatory, you know. And then you, once you, you know, scan your uh, upper, upper and lower occlusal surfaces or your, uh, of the tooth, your upper and lower scans, you can you take a bite registration and scan that also. Send that STL file to the laboratory and we'll do the rest, you know. So, um, Digital impressions, email to the lab. Many, many design options on these types of uh, appliances, multiple software choices. Uh, the file is always available too. If that case is lost or broken, that, that file is available. So it's great. You know, you call us up at the lab, say, you know, Mrs. Smith lost her uh, occlusal splint and you know, she's panicking and you make another one. Yes, we can make another one right away for you. So, um, and there's various printed material choices. You know, we're gonna talk about soft splints. You could do hard splints. Um, and we're gonna talk about the printed technology more than we will on a mill technology. Because first of all, printed technology is a lot quicker. It's a little bit cheaper. And the appliances now are, are very, very good appliances. So uh, 
let's look at the dental lab aspect of uh, digital versus traditional. So now we don't have any models to pour. We can print on models with the uh, STL file that you gave us, or we can do a model list. You know, we can just produce, produce a case without a model, but I like to have a model. I like, to, I like to have that solid working model with me to try things on and put it back on the articulator or just adjust things uh, when, when needed on a model too. So we have that virtual articulation with the, um, you know, the tip and software we have. Quick design of slint material, printing time, much less than acrylic cur curing time. So you don't have to go through all that trouble like I did before in processing a case. Printable materials to soften hard splints. There's no gypsum, no wax, no duplicating, no acrylic. You don't have to worry about patients getting allergic to uh, acrylic or uh, you know, monomer and uh, getting reactions on that, just like you do with dentures. So uh, you don't have to worry about those, uh, those allergic reactions. And then it's consistent accuracy and design. You know, what you see when you're designing these cases on, on the three shape or exocat is what you're going to get in the final result. You know, Fit is precise. The file is stored and available for duplicate appliances, like I mentioned. And split can be designed with cuspid exclusion or into anterior ramps also. So, and the time concept comparison on these types of cases uh, is pretty, pretty uh, significant. You know, the savings. You know, on traditional case, like I showed you earlier, we pour the model, we duplicate the model. That takes about an hour and 45 minutes. And then we are going to, you know, do the next step and uh, just more time consuming than the wax, flask, pack, cure, finish and polish, three hours and 30 minutes. And the total time for making the appliance was about five hours and 15 minutes. And that's according to what materials you're using. You know, so these are using the best materials, the, a heat cured, acrylic or whatever you're using for this type of material. But an average is five minutes, and five hours and 15 minutes working time. Now take a look at the printed technology, how quick we do this. So we're gonna be get the, to get the uh, uh, STL file from you in the dental office. We're gonna design it, nest it, print it, and that's gonna take 55 minutes. And then after we print it, we do a post curing, we clean it, post cure it, we finish and polish, 25 minutes total, 80 minutes compared to five minutes and five, five hours and 15 minutes. So significant time savings on these types of, this type of technology. Now, for first of all, first thing you're gonna do is capture that data, like I mentioned, uh, with the intro oil scanner. And uh, you can use multiple choices for intro oil scanners with this, these types of technology. And you know, scanning these types of cases are very successful. Unlike with uh, you know, uh, fully edentulous patients, when you're trying to capture all the anatomical landmarks in the fully edentulous patients, sometimes you can't cam capture the hamula notch and the retromolar pad on the lingual side, and it's hard to do that with full dentures. We're getting there with that technology. We're very close, but many times we're just scanning models, we're scanning impressions. You know, this you can scan the upper and lower arch and then scan the by registration and send the file to us. So you want to capture that data, that data and, and send it to us and we'll, we'll do the rest. So then we're going to design a plan, you know, using CAD software uh, and uh, you know, can outsource that to different labs too, or, or we will do it at DSG. But we utilize, you know, I like to use 3Shape. 3Shape is my, one of my favorite uh, softwares. I utilize that a lot for, you know, crown and bridge end dentures and now with the uh, biocoastal splints also. So. So we have, this is the upper split, the split design like you see on the screen here. You can add to it, you can take away. We have a virtual articulator we utilize. And even with Exocad, you know, we can, uh, we can uh, have a occlusal thickness as you can see here. You, you can uh, uh, have peripheral th th thickness, you can smooth it. You can block out the undercuts and you know, so many things you could do with these, this software. It's, it's pretty neat. And it's fun to work with, you know, it really is. It's something different than you know, just uh, you know, uh, doing everything uh, at the bench and getting dirty. So it's something new now. And all we have to do is send the file at this point after it's designed to the printer. And there's your virtual articulator with the Exocad too. So we got the virtual uh, fully adjustable articulator, which gives us all the movements we're looking for when designing the closest slim. Then we print and process. There's so many different printers out there. This this is uh, a, another a printer. I'll uh, I'll talk about this in a little while. But we're going to prepare, print, and then we're going to have to pro post process according to material requirements. So uh, this is the Sprint Ray, Sprint Ray printer. Very good printer. They have their own material, but it can also it's open access to other materials on the market, such as Keysoft, Keysplint Soft. We're going to talk about that. And then the carbon, I guess carbon is the one we use most in, in our laboratories, a carbon printer. It's very reliable, and high quality printer. And this, this is the key split material. It's biocompatible, transparent, possible, and stain resistant. And it's, it, you know, it's compliant with international medical device regulations and standards. 
and it's FDA approved and it's a great material. We're really promoting this a lot at, at DSG now. And uh, of course we have such, such, such success with it. No other dental resin can deliver the quality and performance of Keysoft Soft. And what I, why I say that is because um, traditionally when you have a soft occlusal appliance, you know, you have the uh, it's a tendency to take these appliances and just try to rip these things apart, uh, especially with uh, bad structures. They try to grind and chew and, and try to rip these things apart, especially with uh, mouth guard materials like uh, you know, like a, a suck down or a vacuum form material. You know, you've seen it in, uh, in, in, uh, in sports where athletes take these mouth guards, they have it hanging outside in the mouth, they try to chew and grind as much as they can, but they should destroy it. And it wound up being that more detrimental to the TMJ than anything else. These materials are a little bit th different. They're comparing this strength on this material to actually uh, uh, a heat cured clear, uh, like a dense ply resin. So uh, it's very strong and works out really well. So here it is uh, being printed in the nesting area, being printed. So, uh, and uh, that's Keysoft Splint. And after it's printed, we take off those sprues. Then we, then we uh, before we do that, we post cure it. These are all the uh, supporting uh, devices you see here. And there's a couple of different post-curing uh, uh, units here. This is uh, the Sprint Ray Procure. It takes about 30 minutes total uh, to, to post-cure. Uh, but then you, you, if you go to the uh, Uvatron and Teleray, it's only four minutes total. It's two minutes on each side. So the more money you spend, the more, you know, more technology you have, the faster it's going to, think it's going to, uh, you know, going to cure. So uh, it's a light cure uh, type of machine, but it's uh, very strong and uh, works out very, very well. So, uh, and then it's easy to finish and polish. After it's printed and it, it, everything's clean and ready to go, after it's post-cured, we just polish it and finish it like we would any other material. And there's your design splint there. So it's a finished splint. I'm going to show a short little video here in a minute, uh, as you can see the strength of this material. And we delivered the appliances as recommended. And actually, you know, this is nice. This, this sprint rate, we actually print our models. We can print the models with this or the carbon machine, uh, uh, printer also. And we have a nice solid model to go. And very accurate, very solid. We don't have to worry about pouring chips in. And it's a new technology and it works real well. It's exciting. So, uh, so let's talk, let's look about, let's look at this video here real quickly and show you the strength of this material. You know, this technician is going to just try to rip this apart here, try to squeeze and twist it, and it's not going to, it's not going to, nothing's going to happen to it. It's going to go back to its original shape. And look how amazing that is. Yeah. And this is more like a flat splint here. You can, like I said, you can build this up to uh, make it a little bit thicker and design it. But it's nice of this. Pretty cool. So that's some nice technology there on the CAD CAM side. And you can utilize, also use, utilize uh, milling technology also with other materials. So with that, I'm going to end the presentation, but I just want to, before I end it, I want to just mention, you know, splint therapy is the beginning of treatment for uh, patients and not the end. So remember that, you know, while occlusal splints are effective for managing things like teeth grinding and bite occlusions, it's important to note they aren't necessarily a permanent fix for them. You know, so that's where dentists may recommend additional treatments, which include the likes of orthodontists, uh, orthodontics, uh, specialized dental work to adjust occlusion, or even surgery to ensure that the individuals don't fall back into bad habits. So, um, you know, for example, those wearing a repositioning splint, the bite may have changed as a result. However, failure to wear that splint will cause the bite to fall back into the same uneven alignment. So, uh, you know, we had a lot of topics here today. It probably could have covered this in, uh, in about another hour, uh, two hours with more information, but I try to give you the key points today and I really appreciate it. So before we end this though, uh, uh, Jessica has some polling questions and then we'll take any questions at the end. So Jessica, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. Great, thank you, Dennis. Um, You're welcome. This information. I always love how you can pack in about, excuse me, 200 slides in a matter of 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm from New York. I, I talk fast. Yes. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Uh, the polls didn't save on this one. So, oh, it didn't. Okay. My document, and I will just um, I will ask them out loud. Uh, while we're waiting to see if anybody in the audience um, has any questions for us. Okay. Great. That would be great to see. Um, scrolling through here. Do, do, do. Sorry about this, everybody. Yeah, no, no problem. And one 
Wednesday. Any questions for you? Um, so if you don't mind popping up in the chat box, what you think. So which type of bite splint have you had the most patient success with? A splint with canine guidance? A flat, plain splint? A galab? Am I, am I pronouncing that right? Galab appliance? Uh, gelb. Gelb appliance. Gelb appliance. Yeah. Or a hard, soft type splint? And we're curious, which type of bite splint have you had the most patient success with? If you could just type it in the chat box. A splint with canine guidance, a flat, plain splint, a gelb appliance, or a hard, soft? Oh, we're not getting any chats. Okay, no problem. Well, we can, uh, you know, all, a lot of this information on that, uh, that guide that we're going to send out, they can look at it and they can uh, look at those uh, different options too with the different designs, you know, so, uh, but um, yeah, if there's any questions, I'll be all glad to take them. Any questions in the chat box? We've got actually two flat planes, one hard soft and one Bruxy's. Oh, good. Excellent. And um, we're also curious, when you're diagnosing a patient for TMJD, do you evaluate a range of motion? Do you evaluate the dentition wear? Uh, take a CBCT or MRI? Look at oral, medical, and dental history, or a combination of all of the above? We're curious, when you diagnose a patient for TMJD, do you evaluate the range of motion? Evaluate dentition wear? Take a CBCT or MRI. Look at oral, medical, look at oral, medical, and dental history, or all of the above. Um, we've got a combo, uh, dentition wear, range of motion, wear and injuries. Uh, somebody's asking, what do you think of double arch splints? Yeah, that, I, I do double arch splint. I think I, I, I don't know if I showed that in the beginning. And I had, that was a splint we had the upper, upper and lower arch. It's, it's kind of like the Dawson splint. We had a little uh, area on the anterior region. And that really helps for a long lot uh, as far as um, uh, changing the occlusal uh, scheme of the patient or we're doing some rehabilitation. And the patient can wear this all day long. You know, so the uh, upper and lower type splints, double arch is, uh, is prescribed every once in a while. We're really doing in-depth uh, full mouth rehabilitation. And it's comfortable for the patient, you know, too. So especially with these print, these splints with, uh, you know, canine uh, canine disclusion. But this type of split that you're talking about, um, we utilize that too. We also have made splints where the upper and lower uh, upper and lower splint uh, fall. We do even openings. Like instead of doing a four millimeter opening on one appliance, we do two millimeter opening on the, on the lower and two millimeter opening on the upper, and they wear an upper lower appliance. And that, that seems to work too. So. Uh, so it's just sometimes it's, uh, it's trial and error with the, with the patient wants and what they feel comfortable with and what, what kind of therapy and treatment you're going to be doing afterwards. Yeah. Good question, though. Great. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, we got another question. Do you work with a centric relation when designing in CAD CAM? Yes, we work in centric relation. Yes. And uh, what, what we have that, uh, that virtual articulator, though, we can go into different excursions. So when we, we, uh, we, we put like an anterior ramp on those. And uh, so when we go into, uh, it can, you can still have cuspid disclusion on those also. But yeah, it's a, it's a physiological centric relation that we're working with. And then we can, you know, those areas, we, if we do get that indentation, uh, there's a smoothing tool where you can really smoke, smooth, if you don't want any indentations at all and just want that anterior guidance, you can smooth it out. And so, you, so the patient doesn't bite right into those uh, and lock into those uh, indentations. Great. Um, then we wanted to ask everybody, um, have you utilized CAD CAM technology for the occlusal splint therapy? And we're curious if you've used CAD CAM technology for occlusal splint therapy. Um, we got a couple no's. So how recent is this? Uh, it's, it's been around for a few years. I've the, the Big, big uh, move and uh, progress has been on the printing side, you know, and just getting approval on these materials. And you know, Keystone is probably one of the first ones to get the approval on the on this uh, Keysoft material and a good printable material that's going to hold up in the mouth. You know, it's going to be have long, some longevity and take the heavy bruxers that uh, when you utilize this material. So yeah, the printable technology is fairly fairly new. Uh, it's working out great. Um, by new, I mean it's been tested for like the last three or four years, but uh, 
finally got FDA approval on it. And everything you say in, in uh, what, the, what I showed before is true. They hold up, they're strong. So uh, yeah, so it's, uh, it's fairly new with, on a principal side. Milling's been around for a while though. Great, thank you. And I just popped your email address into the chat box in case anybody wants to take that down. Oh yeah, let me I put it up on my screen here. Here we go. Great, uh, yeah, yeah, so, so that way they can contact you. We have yeah, one more question. Definitely. How often do you check the project progress on your TMGD? TMJD therapy. You had bigger words earlier to say fast and that <laughs> yeah. initials. Uh, how often do you check the progress of TMJD therapy? Do you do it weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or every six months? Do you check on your progress weekly, bi-weekly, monthly, or every six months? Um, while we're waiting to get some feedback, uh, somebody's asking, are there any secondary effects of a splint? And is there any anterior antagonist movement? Secondary, well, yeah, secondary effects, if they're not, uh, I think as you're talking about me, secondary negative effects, uh, if they're not made correctly, you're contoured and patient, it can have different, uh, you know, detrimental effects on the occlusion also. You know, we talked about that earlier. And it's almost like, you know, I, I always correlate this with, uh, with snore guards too, snore guard appliances, they're not made correctly. It really has to, you know, especially when in the morning when a patient wakes up, they have to get that temporal mandibular joint back into, into position. And, you know, it can be detrimental if the, if the patient is not di uh, looked at on a regular basis. And you want to, you have to look at the progress of these, you know, so, uh, and uh, it's, that's important, you know, but uh, uh, it's, uh, that's a good, good question because it, I, I've seen this, I've seen this a lot over the years. So you want to have a knowledgeable technician and the right, right diagnosis uh, and, uh, on, on the patient. Great. Um, does anybody have any other questions or comments right now? Um, if not, we'll wait for that to come up. Um, okay. Thank you for attending tonight. Please don't forget to check back to dentalservices.net backslash edu. Uh, Dennis is bringing up an amazing presentation this next week, two times, Wednesday at 12 noon and again Thursday at 730. And it's called the case of the setup gone wrong. And I'll leave yeah. that to Dennis to talk in a little bit more detail on it. Definitely. Good. Well, thanks, Jessica. Yeah, I'm gonna. I, you know, I want to thank everybody for being with us today. You know, it's uh, it's been a pleasure having you with us. You know, we're all here at DSG to help you and uh, support your restorative needs. So, uh, you know, be sure to stay tuned and look out for our future webinars, including what Jessica just mentioned, uh, the case of the setup gone wrong. You know, my background is remo removables, also implant dentures and uh, and uh, full mouth reconstruction with uh, removable cases. You know, so the case of the setup gone wrong is airing next week. It's an interactive who done it mystery denture troubleshooting course. Uh, it's a webinar but the case must be solved and you're gonna to have to help me solve it. So you have eight suspects ranging from the dentist to the technician, to the driver to, that delivered the case. So there's a lot involved, but we're gonna cover all aspects of, uh, of removable technology. It's exciting, it's interactive. So we hope to see you, you know, next week uh, uh, on, the, on the webinar. So uh, um, looking forward, hopefully you're there. So, Thank so you for I, I this evening. And now for your close, Dennis. Okay, thank you, everybody, and we hope you had a positive learning experience tonight, and thanks again for being with us. May you apply your knowledge and expertise in a positive way, in a way that will enhance your careers and your self-work. Well, have a great day, and thank you so much for being with us. Appreciate it. Have a good Bye, night. Bye, everybody. Have Bye a now. great night.